Um, this is slightly changing gears. There will be no differential equations in my talk whatsoever. Um, so the agenda will be, I will briefly discuss some principles that are realized in natural intelligence systems, very briefly, very superficially, and then validate one of the principles in the simulation study, coming to the conclusion that natural systems use strategies of analog computing, which share, at least to our, our feeling, some principles that may be applied in quantum computing as well. Um, comparing those two um, information processing systems somehow suggests that they use different strategies. If you compare the energy consumption between this little house fly that lives an autonomous life in a dangerous environment and the supercomputers, um, it suggests somehow that these use different strategies. So what you see here is the side view of a cerebral hemisphere of the human brain. And these colored areas, they stand for about 100 20 different areas that we have in our cerebral cortex on one side, each of these areas performing a particular function, um, pro processing visual information, auditory information, planning, making motor programs. And the fascinating aspect is that the intrinsic organization, the circuitry in each of these areas is strikingly similar across the whole brain. So the functional differentiation essentially results from different input-output connections. So we think that each of these areas performs the same um, computational algorithm, but applies it to very, very different uh, modalities and um, problems. Um, so what are the canonical features of these biological systems? And what you see here is you can generalize to the fly, to the invertebrates, to the mollusks. Um, the network nodes, the neurons in these systems, they function like very complex analog computers. And they get the thousands of inputs, they compute those inputs, and the output is a single um, digital pulse, but in, in fact it is frequency modulated, so also the output is analog and it is immediately reconverted into an analog signal in the next target cells to a, a chemical process. Then another hallmark is that there is massive reciprocal connections between nodes within each of these processing areas that you just saw. Then there are abundant feedback connections between the areas, and there is also tight reciprocal coupling between these various areas. And the architecture of the network is resembling a small world network or a rich club network. Obviously, these networks exhibit very complex dynamics, indicating that time temporal relations are used uh, for coding of information. So here is just um, a very simplified graph of a piece of uh, cortical tissue. Um, and these red lines, they are all recurrent connections between modules of these uh, cortical areas. And 80% um, of all the contacts within the cerebral cortex are made up of these recurrent collaterals. The input and output connections um, take only about 10% of all the connectivity. So the brain is mainly an autistic system that works on itself. Uh, the same principle, and this reminds me of the fractal idea that has been proposed, is repeated at the level of the connectivity between the areas. Uh, also here, reciprocity prevails. So the red dots you see here, each of these red dots stands for one of these colorful areas that you have seen in the first slide. And the white lines between them, they are massive reciprocal connections, neuronal axons, that interconnect the neurons in these areas with each other. And if one knows one's way in this network, um, one can come from any neuron to any other neuron, either directly or with one or two sitting stations. Because 70% of all possible connections are actually realized in this system. This is a, an astounding number. Um, so what is the structure of a representation in, in such a system? Um, it is a widely distributed spatial temporal pattern of activity in contrast to the readout units in any of the data processing systems that we know. So the end result of the computation is a very highly distributed spatial temporal pattern. And I would like to take you through a sh short Gedanken experiment. Uh, this is the sensory system, cortical areas of the sensory system of a cat with visual centers, auditory centers, tactile centers, and a few limbic centers. And the task of those centers is to 
add emotional connotations, value to the um, result of the pattern recognition process, if you like. So imagine that such a system, and ours is exactly the same, except it is one order of magnitude more complex. We have about 10 times more areas in our brain than the cat. But the connectivity schemes are exactly the same. These many wires in uh, red, green, and lines, they all stand for massive reciprocal connections again. So you see a highly interconnected system. Now imagine that such a system um, is confronted with a polymodal object, a dog that is barking that you can see and touch. Then uh, myriads of neurons will become active in the visual system, namely all those who respond to features that are <coughs> constitutive of this visually, uh, visual picture of the dog. If you touch the fur, the same will be true for the neurons in the tactile system, myriads of neurons getting active namely those which code for features that are characteristic for the fur of this animal. Same for the auditory system if it barks. And the limbic system will find out whether you deal with a peaceful dog or an aggressive dog, whether you should run away or you can uh, continue caressing it. So what is the representation um, of a polymodal object in such a system? And the not further reducible answer is it is a very, very high dimensional spatial temporal pattern of activity of myriads of neurons. There is no point you can point at where this dog would be represented. It is a distributed representation. Now, another very important feature of biological intelligence systems, like nervous systems in general, is that all the nodes, all the neurons, have the property to, the propensity to oscillate when they get. Um, disturbed, they respond with a damped oscillation of various frequencies. And if individual neurons are not already oscillating, which is very much the case in simple nervous systems, you have microcircuits that are wired in a way that makes them function like a damped oscillator. And they cover frequencies from below 1 hertz all the way up to 200 hertz. Now, what are the properties of recurrent oscillator networks? Um, as you guess already, they develop extremely complex nonlinear, very high dimensional dynamics. And there's a nice metaphor this is the superposition of waves in a liquid. If you think of a pond of water in the evening, very still, uh, somebody throwing stones, different places, different times, um, of different sizes, each of these impacts will create a wave. These waves will travel. After a while, they will cover the whole pond. There will be an interference pattern. So, uh, there is storage, superposition, and processing of information in this high dimensional dynamic space of these interference patterns in the pond. Um, what the computations that <laughs> are achieved by this pond are first that it transforms stimuli into oscillatory responses. Then it converts um, sequential events in a high dimensional dynamic state. It has memory which allows the superposition of information through this fading memory. Once the water has become calm again, the memory is gone. So this is why we talk about fading memory. And it can also take that it um, codes both spatial and temporal relations and stores this information in the interference pattern. One can actually show that it suffices to measure at three different places in this pond, as long as the waves are still present, um, amplitude, wavelength, and phase of uh, the local oscillations, and you can reconstitute completely the sequence of events. So this pond is doing interesting computations. It has memory, and these properties are partially um, utilized by what's called reservoir computing. Now, it so happens that recurrently coupled networks have exactly the same properties, except that they are more sophisticated, because the coupling in neuronal networks is highly anisotropic, not confined to nearest neighbors. We have long-range connections that bridge large distances. And then, most importantly, the functional architecture of these recurrent connections, so the weight distributions of these connections, they are shaped by experience, early in development, but then also throughout life, um, which means that the functional architecture of these interaction connections, or the connections that support the interactions, um, serve as an internal model of the world that is required 
in order to interpret the sensory signals that come into these networks. So how is this internal model of the world generated? Um, first of all, in early development, uh, out of a redundant um, reservoir of connections, a subset is selected and consolidated, and all the rest is again uh, destroyed. About 50% of these connections that we are born with, they get destroyed again. Um, and the rule that decides between consolidation and destruction is uh, the famous heavy and rule in our community. Uh, neurons fire together if they fire together. So connections between elements, nodes, um, Nodes that are very frequently active at the same time, whose activity is correlated, they get consolidated, and connections between nodes that are rarely activated together get destroyed. This process continues a lifelong, but no longer is manifest in destruction and reformation of new connections, but you have to live with a network that is formed until age about 20, and then you can still change the gain of the synaptic connections I regulate them up and down according to exactly the same correlation rule. So this means that <clears throat> the functional architecture of these recurrent connections reflects the statistical regularities of environment. Neurons that code for features that tend to co-occur very frequently in the environment get coupled more strongly. Now, what you have is a network of that kind, uh, nodes, that have the propensity to oscillate, that are sensitive to particular features, color, orientation, what have you, sound frequencies. And they are coupled in a very, very sophisticated way through these pruned connections that harbor in their weight distributions the statistical regularities of the environment that the system is going to process once it opens its eyes or is born. So one consequence of this anisotropic coupling is because coupled oscillators tend to synchronize, um, and the coupling strength determines the probability with which they synchronize and the strength, um, semantic relations get translated into synchronization probability. Because semantic relations are encoded in coupling strength, and coupling strength is reconverted in synchronization probability. So the general conclusion so far is, the dynamics of recurrent networks allow to exploit the temporal dimension for coding, very important, which many of the deep learning networks don't. Uh, and then configuring the nodes as oscillators permits uh, to exploit additional variables. One enters the world of synchrony, resonance, entrainment, phase shift, superposition of waves, interference. So the question is, does the brain exploit these properties? We measure them, but we don't know whether they are functionally relevant, which um, well, I skip all the experimental evidence. <laughs> Consult our web page, you will find it, or look at the table. Uh, there's a reference to a paper where all these references are listed. Um, the problem we have in neuroscience dealing with such a highly complex system is that it's very hard to get um, causal evidence for any variable, because if you interfere with this variable using the usual loss or gain of function manipulations, um, you are bound to disturb the rest of the system as well. So in order to get some more insight, uh, we started to simulate such networks. And it is Felix Effenberger, who is the one who can simulate because he's a mathematician. He knows everything about these differential equations that I ignore completely. Um, so we simulated network and added step by step features that we knew from biology to see whether it buys us something. And here's what we did. We simulated a recurrent network. Unfortunately, we had to do it on a digital computer, which is very cumbersome. Um, and then trained this network with a backpropagation through time um, algorithm and had it learn, recognize patterns in this stereotype. Benchmark tests, where one uses handwritten letters and numbers. Um, we scanned them linearly to get the time series and then fed the network with time series and had the network discover or identify the letters. And then check the um, um, performance. And what you see on the le left side is uh, the ordinate is um, classification uh, accuracy, 
going up to close to 100%. And um, on the abscissa are the number of required learning steps. And notice it's a logarithmic scale. And to our great surprise, we discovered that once we configured the nodes as oscillators and not simply as integrators, um, our network started to outperform everything that is on the market by orders of magnitude in terms of learning speed. These are the, the left two curves. Uh, this is the network that is uh, yeah, biologically plausible. Um, so configuring the nodes as oscillators was absolutely important to make this network much more performing than any other. It also showed the extreme noise tolerance. Um, the green line and the, um, um, the reddish line, the GRU, uh, they are the conventional, the most advanced recon networks used nowadays for pattern recognition. Ours is the, uh, the brown line, and you see that the pixel, uh, the noisy pictures that we had the network to um, identify, and um, it showed graceful degradation and was much, much more noise tolerance than all the other systems we know. Then we started to introduce what is so characteristic of natural systems, heterogeneity. We made the nodes prefer different oscillation frequencies. We introduced uh, heterogeneous conduction times because, remind you, communication in the brain is not light speed. It is slowly conducting nerve fibers that have very heterogeneous conduction times. So all these nodes are coupled by delay. So we introduced those delays as realistically as possible using uh, cerebral cortex as an example. And then we also did what nature does. Um, we had these le networks learn the natural statistics of the environments in which they would have to perform later uh, by just showing them um, contours of particular orientation and having them already pre-shape their architecture a little according to the rule I had mentioned, this correlation rule. And this showed, and now you look at the most leftward curve, that introducing these heterogeneous uh, variables uh, greatly boosted again the performance of the net. Um, because uh, it greatly enhanced the dimensionality of the state space of these networks, and it already introduced some correlation structure into the spontaneous activity of the networks that can then be exploited further for learning once you have a, a stimulus given. So this is what happens with learning. Um, the left panel shows the um, coupling matrix, the weight matrix of the naive system. Um, and you should look at the uh, ordinate the color scale. It's very weak coupling. It's more or less all-to-all -all connections in the beginning. And then the system learns, <clears throat> and then you see the weight distributions on the right side, which are characterized by a strong increase of um, certain connections, of excitatory connections, and also a strong increase of inhibitory connections. And all of a sudden, there is a very distinct correlation structure in this network, in the weight distributions, which is also reflected, of course, in the, in the, in the correlation structure of the activity. So here you see. Um, the emergence of stimulus-specific spatiotemporal interference patterns that are caused by learning. The upper panels show the naive network, um, and when you show those letters, the networks respond more or less uh, with rather a boring, globally synchronized activity patterns. And as they continue to start to learn, um, these um, patterns become much more subtle, they become landscapes, um, that are very characteristic for each of these letters and then can be classified very easily by a linear classifier. Um, so this is how these nodes respond to one of the MNIST letters, for example. And this is another letter, and this is another letter. Um, if you are a neurobiologist and record from these nodes and see these signals, you won't understand nothing. It's impossible to interpret the, this variability. So um, what in this system is the representation of a cognitive object, and you will see it is very, very similar to what happens in the real brain. It is a very complex, high-dimensional landscape in phase space. It is sculptured by peaks of synchrony, separated by values of incoherence. And there are highly active zones segregated by less active regions. Active zones due to resonance. There's a strong amplification. Two minutes? Oh, that's fine. Um, so. 
you see immediately that it is possible to configure a virtually infinite number of separable linearly classifiable landscapes in such a high dimensional space. So what did we learn? We learned that if we, if we learn from nature, we end up with a system that excels in all respects, learning speed, noise tolerance, number of nodes and variables, I didn't talk about this, uh, and the speed of conversion supers results, uh, what we have in the technological domain, at least as far as we could scan the literature. Um, there is something unique about the dynamics of coupled oscillators that boosted performance to begin with. Um, and we think it is because coding space is extended by phase space, because synchrony can be exploited, resonance phenomena, entrainment, phase shifts, and in particular the superposition of waves that enables massive parallel evaluation of temporal and spatial relations by interference. Because we have these traveling waves also in this carpet of cortical connectivity. If you disturb it somewhere, you get a traveling wave. Um, so what are the reasons for the stunning performance? We think it is um, the high dimensional dynamic space, space that we get. It's the fact that these computations are all completely analog, which allows for a parallel search for the best match of sensory evidence with the stored prior. It, it's a virtually simultaneous comparison that leads to a collapse of the state space into a um, subspace that is classifiable. Uh, it's self-organizing, and it has low entropy and less free energy as the ongoing activity. So we think, but this is what we want to put at a test here, uh, that this annealing process resembles to some extent what is also done in quantum computing. Because there the spin, um, <laughs> they make a deal among each other. In our case, it's the faces. Um, so yes, um, at least the deep learning networks that we are currently know and the natural networks, are, they differ fundamentally, in, in, particularly in, because the latter use time as coding space which these artificial systems don't. So the outlook would be um, implement this computation strategy in analog technology, which is no longer available on the market, it's completely forgotten, uh, because it's extremely energy efficient, it's miniaturizable, and it works at room temperature. And so we started to play a little bit with, with analog uh, computers. And um, this brings me to the end. Um, Great thanks to my collaborators, in particular to the bottom row, which are the mathematicians and theoretical physicists who are responsible for the simulation studies. And uh, I thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Wolf. It was a wonderful lecture. Uh, we have to bring the... It's, it's Paulo. Paul was talking to us while you are transferring there. It's interesting for people to remember in terms of computation that your brain can do all that under 40 watts, right? So it's one of the amazing things just to think about it while we are doing all that. Not really fancy, but... Okay. Okay, well... So um, thank you very much to the organizers for having me here. Um, as everybody, it's a huge pleasure to be in this place with this audience. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what we've been working on for the past three years to put together an, a quantum initiative in uh, Sao Paulo and Brazil. and. Uh, well, Latin America, but I'm not going to talk about Latin America today, so I'm sorry. I apologize for that. Uh, I've been to a few conferences, and people like uh, Peter Zoller came up to me and asked, why isn't there a quantum initiative in Brazil? Now, he asked me that right in the middle of our previous federal government, which made things very hard, uh, but we thought in the state of Sao Paulo we stood a chance. So I want to tell you a little bit about the efforts that we've been doing to put that together. We've all heard here, 
okay, at the, this wonderful workshop about the ingredients that come into this new revolution in quantum sciences and technologies, uncertainty relations, no cloning and help for security, superposition entanglement, indistinguishability, which give us abilities to process and store information, um, environment-induced decoherence and disentanglement, as Louise told us about, which is very interesting for sensing. Now, a few years ago, you may have seen this special number of the economists on quantum leap. Um, there's one sentence that really stuck with me. This was in 2017, so six years ago. The community thought the odds are good, but the goods are odd. We've seen this picture already before, and uh, Carl made some comments about the numbers um, related to China, for instance. It's clear that there's a huge effort worldwide uh, in terms of economic value of quantum information technologies. And you can see that in the latest version, 22-23, Brazil, which was gray on the picture, suddenly showed up with uh, an effort of 12, equivalent to $12 million. Um, not our best effort. I don't really want to get too much into that, but uh, there are other things going on uh, now. So yesterday, we also heard about the importance of having societal um, concerns and having uh, more equanimous development. Um, that's not true of everything, so I went to a meeting um, in Delft this year, and I saw this on a desk. So are you aware of export controls in the quantum domain, which means that these technologies will not be available to everybody? Um, I think we have good reasons to have a quantum strategy in Brazil. So the people involved in this effort, Engor Viana, Viana Borges, Celso Vilas Boas, who spoke yesterday, Frederico Brito, Gustavo Viderrec, Marcelo Terracunha, myself, and Filipe Corté. You may notice, I don't think it's by chance that out of seven people, four are from São Carlos. We have a pioneer there who has been developing quantum optics, atomic physics, optical physics in general, and I think this shows on, the, on this effort. So we have an international committee, and uh, we were very fortunate to have in February in Brazil uh, three people uh, who are in this uh, picture, Philippe Bouillet, a little different at the, t at the time of this picture, Cristiani, sitting right next to me, whose talk is really hard to follow, and uh, Arthur Eckert, um, who is here in the audience as well, Louise, so four people. I, I'm sorry, Louise, you're local, so um, four people. We actually, uh, I, I have another picture, but I'm not showing today. You should come to these workshops in Brazil. We, ha we went to a restaurant with very nice caipirinha, so you're all more than welcome to develop these things in Brazil with us. Um, so we've set up a flyer. We obviously connect our efforts to the sustainable development goals. Um, there are lots of interesting applications that can come from this. Um, main issues, focus, build on our strengths, enhance our quantum technology R&D strengths, focus on viable technologies, capabilities, collaboration. This is all about a collaborative effort. And readiness, and I think the first part of the readiness is really to educate a quantum workforce. We've heard here also that this is not an issue that is, uh, applies only to Brazil, but it's definitely a very important issue for us in, in Brazil. Now, in uh, my current capacity, um, I've been, uh, so I'm a physicist myself, Special, uh, specialize in quantum optics. Um, and uh, now I say that I'm also an apprentice in the fundamentals of innovation. Um, and this is a framework that has been put forth by a group of people at MIT, um, which I think is extremely important to understand in order to shape public policy. Now, all of this talk may seem to you quite applied, 
Um, and I'm going to say something I've heard from Ed Hines at a conference before, even though this may seem to all of you very applied. I want to vouch here that I myself remain pure at heart. Um, the important thing in this structure is that in order to um, build, to drive a successful um, ecosystem, innovation ecosystem, um, this structure essentially appears everywhere. And it's built on foundational institutions, which are basically the things that don't change so much, so rule of law, um, preferably no corruption, ease of you know, economic um, fostering development. Um, on top of that, there are two capacities, an innovation capacity and an uh, entrepreneurial capacity, which are not the same and which feed into each other um, and can help us take advantage of comparative advantages that we can have in a certain region. I'll uh, um, expand on that. And on top of everything is impact, which is the objective, is the goal of innovation. So why should we uh, build, you know, go after um, an effort to have a quantum initiative in Brazil? Well, I think this is the reason why Peter came up to me and said, how come there is no quantum initiative in Brazil? As Louise has mentioned, we have National Institutes for Science and Technology. These started actually with Millennium Institute projects, bringing together a, a community in AMO physics, but also in uh, condensed matter physics and computer science, math, um, and which, as you can see, is now spread out in almost all the regions in Brazil. So um, the only region that is missing on this map is the northern region in Brazil. But we have uh, a few efforts in the center west. We have strong efforts in the northeast. We have, obviously, preponderance in the, the, in the southeast. And we have important groups in the south, the southern part of the country. What are we good at? Well. Um, Spontaneous parametric down conversion, both theory and experiment, especially the group in Minas Gerais um, pioneered this. And then in Rio de Janeiro, um, they were very strong. The group in Rio de Janeiro, unfortunately, the main experimentalists left Rio de Janeiro. One of them is still in our country, Paulo Henrique Souto Ribeiro, who is in Santa, Santa Catarina. But Steve Walborn, a huge driving force is still in Latin America, so that's the Latin American part that I'm not going to talk about. He's, he went to Chile. Um, Cold Adams, DC, Adam Interferometry, São Carlos, Recife, very strong places, Campinas. Optical parametric oscillators, continuous variable entanglement. Well, we play a modest role in that in our lab back in, in Sao Paulo. Quantum thermodynamics, of which we heard a beautiful talk this morning, mainly using NMR systems, quantum algorithms. We have an initial effort in superconducting qubits in Campinas, and we can go on. Um, so we have the academic strength. We understand the subject. We have the scientists who can train people. We don't have the technological aspect. We're not being able to turn this science into uh, meaningful technology, and this is what we really have to concentrate on. Um, a few more or less recent highlights, so various variable entanglement, uh, experimental work, contextuality, non-locality, photon correlations, maximal demons, quantum thermodynamics. Uh, we have some uh, technological efforts in uh, optomechanics, in, in Campinas, uh, structured light, um, in different places in the country and encoding information in, into this structured light. A very recent effort, um, and uh, Celso already spoke a little bit about this, um, is geared towards quantum communication. So there's now um, the beginning of a Rio quantum network uh, with these institutions, Federal Uni Fluminense Federal University, Antonio Zalakech Curi, uh, Catholic University in Rio, where I was an undergraduate student and a master's student under the supervision of Louise. Uh, the 
Brazilian Center for, for Physics and uh, the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. And uh, this is what it looks like. They intend to have the three universities um, in Rio connected by fiber optic and in uh, air, you know, free air, free space connection from CBPF to the Federal, Fluminense Federal University across the bay. Um, I'm not even prepared to tell you a lot more details, but this is a very interesting proposal with a Sanyak type geometry for the quantum communication process. Um, our military has you know, developed an interest in quantum information technologies, uh, and the cyber defense is now promoting workshops and uh, um, getting together with the scientific community in order to push this forward. So from that issue in uh, The Economist, there's wisdom that uh, for me is very influential from Sir Peter Knight about the difficulty of building you know, these, all, these exquisite quantum machines. And as Louise told us yesterday about the sensitivity and in the interaction with the environment, sorry, the day before yesterday, uh, sensitivity and in the interaction with the environment, how quantum correlations are fragile. Not only quantum coherence can decay exponentially, but entanglement can vanish in a finite time. Or in the case of continuous variable systems, we prove that it, um, you can lose a completely entanglement after finite propagation in a lossy medium, whereas squeezing, for instance, which is our resource, would survive for infinite propagation. So as uh, Peter Knight said, you know, we turn it on its head. If the system's coupled to the outside world so effectively, they're sensing the outside world really effectively. And so this is kind of a defect in building quantum computers. Um, which lead to building better sensors. And this is something which we think is the best shot for our initial efforts in these technologies. Um, I came across, so I heard from a friend who uh, there were people developing quantum sensors for agriculture. I came across uh, this uh, sentence, quantum tech, one of six inventions that will transform farming. And as I told you in that structure for fostering an innovation ecosystem, one of the things that we have to look into is comp comparative advantage, right? So it turns out that when we look at Brazil, um, it's the third largest global agribusiness exporter nowadays, over 100 million hectares available for agricultural expansion without further deforestation. Uh, if we look at FAO reports, uh, and we look at the pr prospects for growth in the agribusiness sector in the world, Brazil clearly has the largest potential there. So with all this potential, Brazil could respond for 40% of the global additional food demand expected for 2050. Now this is a challenge for all of us. The FAO expects us to need to increase in 50% the food production today until 2050. And Brazil could respond for 40% of that. What that means, in my view, is that science or agribusiness has to be focused on Brazil. And again, in innovation, this is a local effort. So the science has to be developed locally. And again, sensors for this are uh, something in which we can lead. We can not just jump in and follow a wave, but Brazil has the potential to lead. So obviously, I went to look at the literature, and I found this paper with this very nice title, quantum-based agriculture, the final frontier. But then I read the abstract, and the abstract talks about intuitive farming incorporating the use of telepathic interspecies communication. <laughs> um, well, uh, you know, we heard also that in order to build innovation ecosystems and drive investments, we need hype. There should be a limit to that. So we really need to increase public awareness of quantum. Um, speaking of something which is not hype, uh, Embrapa is a very nice co uh, company in Brazil. Um, long history of producing technology for the agribusiness sector. And here is Deborah Milori, again, Vanderlei's former student, 
who leads an effort at Embrapa, and she developed a technique called uh, LIBS, laser-induced breakdown spectroscopy, applied to the agribusiness sector. And in this company, they analyzed the carbon content in soil using laser spectroscopy. Now, the usual techniques, chemistry-based, um, companies can analyze about 900 samples per month. In Agrohobochka, using this technique, they analyze 1,200 samples a day. So there's a lot of promise in, in this sector. These are companies that have been working together with us for the development of this roadmap and with whom we expect to work together in agriculture, computing, communications, education, engineering, and health. Now, I told you about this uh, picture for fostering an ecosystem. And the Deputy Provost for Innovation looked at this. If we look at the ICAP and ECAP, they have five resources each. They're, all, they're, they're the same. Human capital, funding, infrastructure, demand, culture, and incentive. But when we look at them, uh, you're not going to be able to read, but the input for innovation capacity is not the same as the input for entrepreneurial capacity. Um, Human capital, quantum, building a quantum workforce is definitely important. It's a multidisciplinary effort. As we heard from John Martinez, I'm definitely convinced that physicists won't do this alone. We need engineers to develop technology, but we need engineers who understand quantum technologies. And our strategy is, well, let's learn about quantum computing from its um, defects. So let's train these people building useful quantum sensors. Um, how, so I'm very optimistic that a new program on quantum information technologies after three years of us working on this will be approved on December 13 with the prospect of giving 20 million US dollars for the state of Sao Paulo. And uh, this will give rise to our program on information. On, so in Portuguese, it's inverted. So it's going to be ITO. Uh, Pi quant. And just to you know, leave you with this message, Raul uh, Gonzalez, the Deputy Provost for Innovation at the University of Sao Paulo, compared this to a control system. We have 10 actuators. That's where we can play, we can tweak the system. And so with these actuators and control theory, eventually we can steer this into a positive result. And obviously, I don't have to tell this audience about control theory and its abilities, but I do want to show you what our engineers at the university can do. And we also saw before what you know we can do with waves in a pool. So let me just uh, leave you with this. So you know we can play with rather complex systems. And so this is what they're doing. If you look at the yellow um, actuators, they're moving. And uh, they can do a constructive interference. And there you go. You have something really nice that can be done. And with that, I thank you for your attention. Staying on time and a beautiful talk. I think it's seen there's lots of things being developed. And uh, right now, we, we're going to Vlad Yakovlev, he's my neighbor in Texas, to tell us a little bit more about quantum and biology. OK, so finally, it's working. OK. Uh, thank you very much, Ricky, also uh, for organizers that have given me the opportunity to talk today. And see, uh, thank you all for um, uh, staying here. Um, there's the wonderful conference, and uh, I also want to thank the previous speakers, the Wolf, uh, Christiane, Martin, Jose, Kiwatsu, for bringing up uh, this topic of uh, uh, biology and medicine. And uh, this is the uh, kind of uh, so trying to give you an overview of what uh, we're doing at Texas A&M, and to give you some perspective uh, uh, from my point of view, Kiwatsu, where uh, this field is going. Okay, so theory, of course, uh, expects you, Kiwosu, to have all these the quantum skiers. Uh, 
So if you try to do it in experiments, uh, so you have uh, likely uh, something else, the slightly different outcome. Well, so this is always the case. Okay, well, so that's why okay, well, so I'm taking it the pragmatic view of quantum mechanics for biology, trying to understand okay, well, so what we can learn from that and the, how we can benefit the, from the ideas the, uh, that the, are currently being there. So why quantum biophysics? So really, okay, well, so uh, we are treating a uh, living system as the black box uh, where most the physicists uh, um, so, but the uh, living system, okay, well, so is uh, mostly explored by biologists. They, they know everything, okay, well, so they do experiments. She, as a result of this experiment, they get some unusual results. And this is how they come up with all these crazy ideas which involve uh, uh, quantum coherence, the uh, super radiance, okay, well, so just name it, okay, well, so really, okay, well, so each time, okay, well, so they can't explain things they, uh, in a simple classical manner, okay, well, so are they using quantum ideas, okay, well, so without she really paying attention what they mean. On the other hand, okay, well, so they're um, medical doctors, and she, they're pretty conservative people, okay, well, so, and she, um, they are trying to uh, do the, their best job in treating people, but she, unfortunately, okay, well, so it's a very complicated task, and she, that's why, okay, well, so whenever, okay, well, so they fail, they um, are open to new ideas, and she, uh, things like uh, quantum health, okay, well, so in this case, okay, so it's uh, the name of the company. Okay, well, so it's also uh, comes the uh, pretty health. Okay, so basically, okay, well, so we understand, okay, well, so where uh, um, biologists and medicine actually, okay, well, so uh, willing to talk to us about the quantum ideas. So question is, okay, well, so quantum medicine actually possible? Well, so this is the kind of my dream job, okay, well, so is the uh, trying to build see, some kind of uh, quantum control loop, okay, well, so, and we heard a wonderful talk today about the quantum control ideas. I will not go uh, to the details, and I will not see, tell you that it's the, uh, feasible right away, but the one point that I want to bring is that the efficient control good sensors are needed, and the probably, okay, well, so this is the, the most likely application of uh, the next generation of uh, quantum devices in medicine is the better uh, sensor and imaging system. So fundamental questions is always okay, well, so is that we're trying to understand the uh, basic mechanisms by which uh, biological system is driven. So we go uh, from organs and cells uh, to um, uh, molecules, and that's where okay, well, so, uh, we uh, meet quantum mechanics. Uh, um, so at smaller scale, quantum mechanics obviously is involved, and then we're, we're trying to go back and to try to understand, okay, well, so the origin of diseases, the, so um, somewhere, okay, well, so we lose the, this, the notion of quantum mechanics, and uh, so it's the really, okay, well, so we want to understand where it's getting lost. And the, uh, really, okay, well, so the notion of quantum mechanics uh, uh, is pretty old, and it's not coming from Schrodinger, okay, well, so in 43, so it's not coming from Einstein, who was, the, who was considering, okay, well, so uh, physics to describe living systems, but she quickly realized uh, how primitive physics is, uh, also, and it's still uh, valid. Uh, uh, but uh, really, okay, well, so uh, quantum theory, okay, well, so came of, uh, um, in biology, okay, well, so first came in 1919, it was so when uh, John Jolly described the uh, the uh, origin of color vision uh, using quantum theory. At that time, the electric effect uh, um, was already been known. Okay, so just a quick reminder: uh, H bar is zero, okay, so it's the building of NIH. And she, uh, despite the fact that uh, most of the medical imaging, imaging modalities are using uh, quantum methods, uh, quantum mechanics. Uh, so it's really okay, well, so nobody uh, seriously talks about the uh, quantum law. And she, there is an obvious reason for that. So biologists think that uh, uh, evolution was uh, for 3.5 billion years, and uh, if nature haven't designed the uh, quantum biology uh, or quantum human by that time, okay, well, so that means uh, there is a reason for that. So chemistry uh, take uh, um, a simple approach, they pretty much say that, say, oh, uh, 
uh, quantum doesn't exist because it's warm, okay, so it's wet and wiggly, or W cube, uh, and see, pretty much only physicists think that uh, the NG quantum mechanics provides the most uh, accurate description of uh, the world around. So, what's the, uh, the real truth? The truth is that she, um, well, so probably we can also quantum mechanics uh, plays in a role. And she, uh, this is just a uh, Wikipedia web page you can also showing metabolic pathways uh, in uh, just uh, one of the systems there. So you see it's uh, pretty messy and biology is very smart. Uh, so really we can also design uh, our system in such ways so that there are many pathways and if uh, one pathway doesn't work, so the other one opens up, and so on and so on. So there is a, a reasonable um, a way, to, a reasonable way of thinking is that she, one of those pathways is actually employing quantum mechanics, and she, it's really okay. So it's a question okay. Also, when uh, this the um, uh, mechanism opens up for us. So in some sense, okay. Well, so you think about this, okay. Well, so it actually opens up for. Uh, quantum medicine, okay, also because uh, whenever, okay, also you're pretty much dying, okay, also, and your organism is going uh, to the last resource, so that's maybe, okay, also something that uh, can potentially help. So this is the, um, something to think about, uh, but the, um, also just summarizing, okay, also there are several established areas of quantum biology, so I will not go through these details, but uh, please look at uh, the bottom note uh, and the from the point of NIH, National Institute of Health, so nothing of this is physiologically significant. So that means not, that nothing of these okay, also allows you to diagnose and treat diseases, and uh, this is the, the major problem. Okay, so NIH is very custom-oriented agency, so um, if you can't prove that it's uh, useful for them, okay, also, sorry, no money. Okay. So um, we're talking about quantum brain. Okay, so there are several uh, talks today, we can also, and really we can also goes back to Michelangelo. Um, also, if you notice, actually, uh, God is actually not in cave, but uh, inside the brain. Okay, also, so really we can also is the their quantum communication inside the brain. And I think this uh, uh, idea came from this 1994 paper of uh, Hamerov and the uh, Penrose. Uh, it's kind of interesting marriage uh, in this paper of uh, medical doctor and the uh, mathematician. So when he came up with this idea, okay, also rather speculative that the microtubules, which consist of uh, uh, those the uh, polymers the of uh, tubulin, okay, also uh, can perform this uh, quantum communication. So uh, microtubules by itself is a very interesting object. It also it's uh, abandoned inside the cells. Uh, so in this uh, case, okay, well, so human cells are shown green, uh, um, uh, uh, green fluorescence shows you the location of microtubules. You see there are plenty of those. They are relatively small, 20 nanometers in diameter, can be uh, several micron in length, and it's very dynamic. System. So they are constantly polymerized, depolymerized, and the, um, it's, it's an interesting system. So um, I was lucky enough that the DARPA at certain point decided to put certain amount of money to see if uh, communication between cells uh, happens uh, through those microtubules, and the, uh, they wanted to see if it uh, happens in gigahertz range. Okay, well, so, well, so uh, just uh, um, to tell you upfront that uh, uh, they don't communicate uh, through gigahertz, uh, uh, so we failed on this. But the, it allowed us to explore potential resonances in this. So basically, we came also at the Air Force Lab. We came also they built a, a special device for this. We came also for RF exposure of cells, tissues, and the, in this case, microtubules. So the idea was we came also just to see how uh, microtubules interact uh, with uh, these uh, gigahertz electric fields. Uh, and the, um, there are plenty of scientific questions to be asked. Uh, but uh, we just decided to explore this. Um, we want to use the uh, non-invasive techniques to do that. She, we use Raman spectroscopy and she look for some changes and not expecting too much, to be honest. So um, this is just Raman spectrum of water. Okay, well, so uh, many of you are familiar, except that okay, well, so it's the 
uh, plotted in a logarithmic scale. Okay, well, so just reflecting that we need really high dynamic range to see all some differences. So we add the microtubules into the solution uh, to see that, okay, well, so indeed, okay, well, so we see spectrum of these microtubules. We turn on uh, radio frequency to see what happens. This is the like first surprise. So first surprise, we see that, okay, well, so we see all of a sudden the buildup of low frequency vibrations in microtubules um, when uh, we are on resonance with these microtubules. So relatively modest electric fields, okay, well, so you get us frequencies, so what happens when we go off it? So all of a sudden, okay, well, so we see disappearance of these low frequency vibrations, but we see structural changes in water, okay, well, so which manifested in uh, uh, the re uh, Raman resonances, which are, are related to that. So what's going on? Okay, well, so it's really okay, well, so it took us several years, okay, well, so to realize that that actually water is getting affected by radio frequency. So we can repeat these uh, uh, measurements uh, for uh, on resonance and resonance for microtubule is getting pretty much the same result. Okay, well, so there is some structural change of the water. So um, then, okay, so um, we can go off resonance with water, okay, so where water is uh, not really interacting with RF, okay, well, so we see pretty much no result. So it's really, okay, well, so it's interaction of RF with water, which causes this structural difference. So what's going on? So apparently, okay, well, so in theory, um, uh, people have uh, speculated about the, the existence of these the, uh, water clusters, but uh, everyone thought that they are spontaneously rise in water, so um, also there are lots of uh, theories behind that, okay, well, so, but this was the very first demonstration that we can actually achieve those uh, quantum domains of water, okay, well, so using this uh, uh, gigahertz excitation, and actually, okay, well, so theorists went as far away as they, they predicted that vibrational spectrum will change, and so, uh, we roughly observed what the theories predicted, so we are pretty confident at this point that the uh, we were able to do that. So with all these development, we actually okay, also developed a very interesting tool, okay, also, which allowed us uh, uh, to do something that uh, is really okay, also, uh, difficult to do in any other way. So okay, also, label free drug interaction, because we brought this Raman microscopy to the level of uh, sensitivity, which allowed us uh, to look at the uh, uh, drug interactions with uh, uh, pharmaceuticals, the protein-protein interactions, and uh, things like that. But it's all classical math. Can we do something with the uh, quantum methods? Uh, and uh, the first uh, thing that uh, you want to explore is the quantum correlation. So this is how we came with this idea of counting molecules in meters in this uh, your focal volume. So it's actually okay, well, so it's not a trivial task if you think about this, okay, well, so because the, no matter how tight you focus your light, the, well, so there will be still more than one molecule uh, there. So the question is how you can use quantum measurements to do that. So uh, the idea was that, okay, well, so why don't we just uh, look uh, at the statistics of uh, the light emitted by this, and see, we actually were able to estimate this. We need see, quite a lot of number of measurements, uh, so roughly 10 to the 5, 10 to the 6, uh, in order to be able to count uh, those molecules, but see, uh, we are able to do that. Then we ask this question, okay, well, so can we actually distinguish different molecules? And apparently, okay, well, so we can do this uh, as well, okay, well, so, so except that, okay, well, so for each additional uh, um, molecule that we want to distinguish, you roughly need additional uh, five orders of magnitude for uh, those type of measurements, but uh, it's uh, still possible. So now the question is, okay, well, so can we actually improve our classical measurements by uh, using quantum light? And this is okay. Well, so uh, what we were doing for the last ten years. Okay, well, so the Garden uh, recently acknowledged this as one of the biggest uh, science stories of 2022. So we used the uh, what is called the uh, Brillouin microscopy. So where we uh, shine uh, monochromatic light the, on a sample, look at the uh, inelastic scattering, and by looking at the uh, the frequency shift and the the line width, we can actually get the uh, elasticity and viscosity measurements uh, in a biological system. And it works extremely well. Okay, well, so this is the okay, well, so, uh, cells in soft and stiff environment. We turn these the, uh, 
uh, real world contrast and humidity sees that in stiffer uh, environments the cells they get stiffer, so red color means they uh, they uh, stiff. Unfortunately, kill cell cells don't like high power. So um, 10 milliwatt of power is enough to kill those cells, and we can monitor these kills by looking at uh, viscoelastic properties as well. So what's the solution? Solution is quantum light spectroscopy, and we generate squeeze light to do that. So we use the stimulated Brillat spectroscopy in this case, and the, um, so by uh, using quantum light, the, we can actually achieve uh, the reduction of noise. That allows us to increase the contrast measurements, and she, I think this is uh, give us uh, really give us uh, the future for uh, many of these microscopic techniques that uh, you can achieve this quantum advantage, which allows you to use the less light uh, to uh, get the uh, much higher contrast rate. So we can actually do cancer cell imaging. We can also increase contrast there. We can also we uh, see that the uh, we actually induce less the photo damage using quantum light. We can even image the brain. We can also, of course, it's drosophila brain. We can also the only millimeter large. We can also, but uh, still we can achieve uh, uh, better contrast using uh, quantum light. So what else? So the problem is that we can also uh, we know that the uh, scattering we can also uh, is not particularly friendly to. Uh, quantum properties of light, and we heard beautiful talk by Louis de Vierich, uh, who was talking about environmental induced sudden death of entanglement. Well, so someone will say, "Oh, okay, well, so this is bad." Okay, well, so uh, I'll turn this uh, turn this uh, argument around, and I say, "Okay, well, so this is actually very good." Okay, well, so and I'll explain you very briefly. So basically, okay, well, so if you are using uh, optical microscopy methods, in particular optical co uh, coherence tomography. So you typically use the like coherence properties of light to uh, get your signal so that uh, uh, you are not polluted with uh, scattered light. So why not use entanglement for this? And actually, okay, also just recently we demonstrated this. Okay, also uh, we use it the lidar system. Okay, also uh, to uh, demonstrate the proof of principle that the quantum entanglement actually helps you to do that. But uh, we are currently moving to microscopy system and the uh, in. Uh, uh, this case, we okay, also show that the uh, quantum entanglement allows you also to reduce this uh, scattering at least the order of magnitude to, to achieve uh, better uh, gating. And uh, of course, we get the beautiful in. So, in summary, okay, also I hope I convince you that the quantum biology is not a new frontier, but the instrumentation development the, uh, makes it look uh, sexy. Okay, also uh, generates more hype and. The, uh, makes the things the more interesting. Observing quantum effects in biological system is a non-trivial task, and uh, especially if you are looking for effects uh, which have any physiological significance. Quantum optics, on the other hand, provides you with new methods of observing and controlling biological systems, and allows you to improve sensitivity, specificity, and spatial resolution, which is actually okay. Also, biologists are really looking for. So there are plenty of needs there. We need better light sources, better detectors, the, and so on. And most importantly, if you're really serious about the uh, uh, biologists and medical doctors listening to you, you demonstrate you need to demonstrate something which has a potential impact. Well, so at the end, I just want to acknowledge uh, uh, all my group members uh, who contributed to this book, and uh, thank you very much for your attention. Oh, that was now. Thank you very much, Vlad. We are stopping here. We'll take notes of your questions, and we'll do the questions afterwards. Okay? Thank you very much.